Thank you so much for streaming our latest message from First Baptist Church. Here at FBC, our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We do that by thinking big, thinking small, thinking in, and thinking out. We hope that this message helps you as you continue to grow in your faith. If you would like to stay connected to FBC, you can visit our website at fbcloyd.ca, look us up on Facebook and Instagram, or download our free mobile app. Now here's the latest from FBC. Enjoy. Thanks, uh, team. I'm always uh, impressed with God. Um, as uh, Barry was <clears throat> sending out his uh, list for this week, um, for songs for the team and so on and so forth, and then as the week developed, uh, just to see how apropos uh, that these songs were just, uh, we didn't know on Monday what was going to happen by Thursday and, and so on. And so uh, just as we were singing again this morning, I just marvel at God and his foresight and the way that he guides and directs and, and leads us. Um, as we're all aware, uh, life as we know it has changed remarkably in just a few days. And... Um, as this threat of the coronavirus pandemic escalates and as the measures are taken to try and offset that and to limit its uh, advancement or to flatten the curve or what have you, many of us um, are experiencing the weight of it. We're, we're seeing, um, or not just across our community, but across our provinces and across our country, around the world, um, the fear that's setting in. And, and um, so I recognize that as we come this morning, that there are people that are, are burdened, uh, that are apprehensive, um, fearful. So while we don't recognize the full extent of what might happen as a result of this virus, and, and as the future remains unknown to us, um, I do want to encourage you with the fact that we do know our God. Like Barry was talking, um, we can be assured this morning that in spite of the COVID-19 outbreak, um, it isn't caught God unaware. He wasn't taken by surprise nor has it suspended his ability or his sovereignty over it. He's still in control. He is still good. And he's still at work. And so today, even in the face of these challenges that we're experiencing right now, the uncertainties that are coming with them, we can take comfort and confidence in him. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. He promises to uphold us. And he offers us every day new mercies and peace that passes understanding. So this morning, wherever you might be in all of this and however it might be affecting you, take heart. Take heart today. We can be confident and we can carry on in God's strength and in His ability, in His goodness, and we will prevail. Now, that said, as an early exercise or perhaps even a test of your perseverance, I'm going to now subject you to my message for this morning. So we'll get some practice in on this perseverance idea. We are in a series called Jesus' Greatest Tweets, which is another way of saying the Sermon on the Mount. And we are right now in a section where Jesus is bringing further insight into the proper interpretation of the law. You'll recall that he announced that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And Contrary to the teaching at the time from 
the Pharisees and religious leaders, there was more to the law than they were expressing. In their very literal and narrow interpretation of the law, they were leaving room for lots of sinful activity. So Jesus, in this section, sets out to correct that, if you will. And as Ryan has pointed out previously, here we see that Jesus comes along and in fact, he ups the ante, if you will. He increases our responsibility under the law, calling us to an even higher standard. Jesus began with murder, which we looked at last week, the whole area of murder. This week, he carries on as we look at the idea and the area of adultery. But before we go any further, let's just once more again stop and pray and ask God to be with us. Father, this morning, Lord, as we gather together and as we're preoccupied with so many different thoughts and ideas, questions and concerns, Lord, I pray that you might come now and that you just might minister to our hearts and our minds that you would bring us your peace, that you would allow us to focus on what your Son is telling us today through his message on the Sermon on the Mount. Father, speak into our hearts and our minds. Let us understand you better through this today, that we might know you more, that in turn that then we would be able to bring ourselves in line with who you are calling us to be and who you would have us to be as your children in this world around us, even now at a very tumultuous time. So to that end, God, I pray these things, and I ask them all by way of your Son, and for his sake alone, amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, please open them up, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30. If you don't have Bibles, there's one maybe right in front of you in the pew, or by all means, you can follow along with us on screen as we uh, read that together. So Matthew 5, verses 27 to 30. Jesus speaking, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. This morning, as we come to these four verses, the way that I want to try and tackle it is this. We're going to focus primarily on the first two verses. And then I'll briefly address the last two verses, and we'll finish up this morning with some thoughts overall on this whole section, if you will. So we're going to begin with verse 27. And there we read, You have heard, Jesus says, that it was said you shall not commit adultery. Now, as we come to that, and as we hear Jesus just say, well, you've heard that it was said. Don't interpret that this morning as just Jesus referring to some sort of a colloquial saying or some little random idea of conventional wisdom. He's not just sort of flippantly referring to something indiscriminate. He is very definitely referring to the seventh commandment. And so, what we need to understand this morning, that most people that were in his audience at that time would not have read the Ten Commandments by virtue of the high illiteracy rate at that time. They would have heard about the Ten Commandments. So, he's referring to them and to this section of Scripture by way of how they would have first encountered it. They would have heard about it. They would have heard about it also by virtue of their ancestors, that it had come down from their ancestors. And the Jewish people were very, very focused on the law. 
This was an area that would have been very familiar to them because it was so important to the Jewish people. The law was was paramount to them. And it was stressed to them over and over again by the religious leaders. It was a focal point for them. So they would have been well aware of what Jesus was talking to as he began to refer to the seventh commandment. But even beyond the fact that it was part of the law, it was a part of the Ten Commandments, which again carried even a higher rate of significance. This was the Ten Commandments that God had spoken, actually spoken to their ancestors as they came out of Egypt and into the desert and as they came to Mount Sinai. You'll recall God came down on the mountain in fire and he was covered with smoke. And out of the smoke and the fire, God spoke to the children of Israel and gave them the Ten Commandments. And then, beyond that, then he wrote them down on the tablets for Moses. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 20 or in Deuteronomy chapter 5. So, as the people are sitting there, we need to understand today that they would have not only recognized what Jesus was referring to here, but they would have also understood the weight of it being a part of the Ten Commandments. And so we need to recognize that as well. This is important for us as we come then to verse 28. Jesus says there, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in, her, in, or in his heart. And the first thing that we see here is Jesus says this, but I tell you, but I tell you. Now, as we talked about a few weeks ago, the theme that runs through the Sermon on the Mount is the theme of the kingdom of God coming near to us. That's the theme that just lopes along in the background all through Christ's teaching here. More specifically, the theme is that the kingdom of God has come near to us in Christ, in Jesus himself. And therefore, we're to understand that as the kingdom of God has come near to us in Christ, in Jesus, then we begin to understand and know how we participate in the kingdom of God, which is to say that we participate in it through Christ, that he is the one that's opening that up to us, helping us to have insight and wisdom and understanding into how the kingdom of God operates. So here again now, this morning, as we see Jesus say, but I tell you, we find Jesus giving the people an indication of his identity. Don't miss it. Against the backdrop of God speaking to the people, their ancestors, from out of the fire and smoke on Mount Sinai as he gave them the Ten Commandments. Against that backdrop, now Jesus says, but I say to you, and he begins to speak into the Ten Commandments, not replacing them, like you said before, not overruling them, but expounding on them. And as he does that, the implication is that his words are equal to those of the Ten Commandments themselves. Now that would have got the people's attention. And it needs to get our attention today. Who is this guy that speaks to the Ten Commandments as God did when he gave them to us? In Christ's words, being paralleled in equality with the commandments themselves, there's an implication that comes as an indication of Jesus' identity. Who is this Jesus that speaks with the authority of God? Could he really be God? Don't miss that. Beyond who is speaking to us, though, we also need to consider what it is that he says. And so we carry on. But I tell you that anyone 
who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now here again, as he did previously on the topic of murder, Jesus rolls the violation back far ahead of the actual act itself. Jesus comes along and says that the sin actually occurs far before you ever commit adultery. The sin of adultery is not confined then to the act itself, but occurs already at the point at which it is conceived in our minds. So as William Barclay puts it, not only the forbidden action, but also the forbidden thought is guilty in the sight of God. The man who is condemned is the man who deliberately uses his eyes to awaken his lust. The man who looks in such a way that passion is awakened and desire deliberately stimulated. Jesus says that such a person then has committed adultery in their hearts. And as we hear him say that, we have to ask ourselves, well, who hasn't? At that point, if that's the deal, then who hasn't sinned? In keeping with what he has said before, we see that God's standard reaches far beyond just our actions, but right to our very hearts. And it harkens right back to what he said to us in verse 8, as we looked at the Beatitudes earlier. Blessed are the pure in heart. This morning, we need to understand that God's call on us then is to be pure from the inside out. Pure from the very core out. Nowadays, we see that things are often, more often than not probably, dressed up to present a better image. And yet underneath, are relatively cheap and worthless. Don't we? We see this in many ways. I'd use for an example, furniture. We can have this thin veneer of expensive wood, mahogany or oak or cherry wood. This thin slice on the outside that's glued then relatively cheap particle board underneath. It gives us the appearance of being precious and expensive and attractive and desirable. But underneath, it's common, basic, relatively cheap and worthless. We see it often in jewelry. Jewelry can have a thin plating of gold that makes it look expensive and attractive. But underneath, again, we find a cheap metal on the inside. And so often it is that we try this approach with our lives before God. That we dress ourselves up on the outside thinking that that is good enough, that that's going to be sufficient. And we're content to try and do and say the right things and think that that is good enough, that we've succeeded, that we've done pretty well. 
But God comes along and he says his standard is pure gold all the way to the core. That it's not good enough to just have this thin veneer on the outside. That it isn't sufficient to just polish our actions and our deeds and call it good. And therefore, we need to understand this morning that what blocks us in pursuing that standard to our very core must be dealt with. Which leads us then to verses 29 and 30. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. This morning, if you would like to see a little bit more in-depth exposition on this, then I would refer you back to our series last year when we tackled the the Gospel of Mark and when we went through the Gospel of Mark. Specifically, I would point you to the last part of chapter 9 where this teaching is dealt with from Jesus again more specifically there. We, We took some more time there, so I'll refer you back. Go back and look that up if you're more interested in, in it. This morning, for the sake of time, suffice to say that here, Jesus is pointing out that sin, whatever it is that makes our hearts impure, must be dealt with severely and decisively. Now, there are some that would contend that this is to be taken literal. Literally, that we should resort up to and including self-mutilation. I don't go so far because I think that if we pursue that, and as a lot of commentators have pointed out, if we pursue that idea, well, we run into a real problem very quickly. I can can see a problem and I can have a problem with my right eye and I can pluck it out, but that leaves my left. And sure as shooting, my left eye is going to give me a problem too, so then do I pluck that one out as well? And if I do, well, then now I am blind. And has that solved my problem? I no longer see the issues physically, but mentally I can still conceive of them there. So what does that require? That I do a lobotomy in order to keep from sinning? I don't think that as we pursue that line of thought that that is really helpful. So instead, what I think that Jesus is trying to say is that Take this area of sin seriously in your lives. Do not downplay it. Do not think of it as relatively petty and inconsequential. Deal with it severely. Deal with it decisively. Deal with it harshly if necessary in order to deal with it. But deal with it we must. And the question then becomes, why? Why deal with it severely? And Christ answers us, because it leads to hell. Sin leads to hell. Now, talking about hell is not popular. We don't like talking about the coronavirus nowadays. We're uncomfortable with that. That gives us some trepidation, some anxiety as we think about that. But we really don't want to talk about hell. As a society, we've gone out of our way to make this issue of sin far from dire. Our sin is to be expected. Our sin is to be tolerated. Our sin is to be treated. Because after all, we aren't perfect. Nobody's perfect. That's an unrealistic expectation. And on the other hand, for the most part, we're all good people. Right? So we don't have to get all cranked up 
about sin. We don't have to be preoccupied with that. Even in church nowadays, we're not confronted with the idea that our sin is to be mourned. As Ryan talked about early in this series, that it is to be lamented, confessed, and that we need to seek forgiveness from God and turn, repent from it, and turn from it. Today we carry on content, thinking that we've got a nice gold-plated veneer. And that's good enough. That's sufficient. However, here we see Jesus, who again is dropping clues for us as to his identity as God himself. Almighty God himself come to us and telling us that actually, kids, actually, contrary to popular opinion, my standard is purity and perfection. And those that don't accomplish that standard are in line for hell which we see in other teaching, is not a desirable option. Now our text today ends here. And if you're like me, that isn't a comfortable place to leave it because if I'm honest, even remotely close to being honest, I know that I have come absolutely nowhere even close to God's standard. That I fall far, far short of it. So it's not comfortable a place to leave it. Because left here, I'm in line for hell. Thankfully, the good news of Jesus is that he provides for us a way to get out of this line. And so this morning, I want to end with some thoughts on this passage from Oswald Chambers, who in looking at this area, as God calls us to be pure, offers us this. Chambers writes, Jesus Christ demands that the heart of a disciple be utterly pure. And unless he can give me his disposition, his teaching simply teases me. If all he came to do was mock me by telling me to be what I can never be, I can afford then to ignore him. But if Jesus can give me his own disposition of holiness, then I begin to see how I can actually be pure. Jesus Christ is both the sternest and the gentlest of saviors. The good news of God is not only that Jesus died for my sins, but that he gave himself for me, that I might give myself back to him. God cannot accept goodness from me. He can only accept my badness. And in exchange, he will give me the solemn goodness of the Lord Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul sums it up this way. He says there, God made him who had no sin, that is Jesus, to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
not in and of ourselves, that we would become the righteousness of God. But in Christ, in Jesus, that we would become the righteousness of God as we allow Christ to replace our badness with his goodness that he offers to us. This morning, as we come to this section on adultery, we need to hear Jesus speaking into our lives today, telling us the truth. That God himself, God Almighty has come to tell us that my standard today is perfection, purity, And that as such, as we hear him talk about adultery, then we need to recognize that we have missed that mark. That each one of us have missed that mark. That we cannot be pure. That we cannot achieve his standard. And he's not doing that today to tease us. He's not doing that today to make us angry and frustrated. He's not doing that to just dangle that in front of us and laugh at us. But he's come to make that known to us so that we can then understand what he offers to us through his son. We've missed the mark. Every one of us has missed the mark. But in Christ as we place our faith in him, as we trust in him on account of his death and resurrection, overcoming sin and death, that then we can be made righteous in him. As we come to him, confess our sin, offer to him our badness, and allow him to replace it with his goodness. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift in Christ. Let's pray. Father, this morning, God, as we come to this passage, thank you that you would care to come and give us the truth that you would condescend to our level to break through the conventional wisdom of ourselves and our world that tries to tell us and tries to convince others and ourselves as well that we're good enough, that we can just polish up ourselves enough to make the cut. Father, I pray that as we realize, as you lay it out for us, and that as you explain to us that we can't, I pray, God, that we would turn to you then, that we would recognize our deficiency, that we would repent of our sin, God, that we would turn from it, that we would turn to you, that you would forgive us then, and that you would restore us. And that you would replace our badness with your goodness day by day by day as we lean into you. So to that end, God, I pray. And I ask these things all in Christ's name for his sake. Amen. Just before we leave today, can I take a moment and encourage you? As we go out into the world around us right now with all of the uncertainties and all of the fears, all of the concerns, the panic even that we're seeing. Can I encourage you to go out and seize this opportunity to touch the world tangibly, touch those around us with the good news of Jesus Christ, even as we be his hands and feet and offer them a different perspective than panic and fear. This 
event, unprecedented and in my experience, gives us an opportunity, as Barry talked about, where we can make it personal for someone as we see needs, as we see fears, as we see concerns, as we see people worried for their very existence. We can take this time and we can come alongside and we can show them the good news of Jesus Christ. Don't miss it. Let's not squander it. Let's not shrink from it. Let's seize it and leverage it all for Christ's sake on account of what he's done for us without fear, confidence in him, and for the good of the world around us. Have a great week. Stay tuned for more updates. And go make it personal for someone out there that doesn't know him yet.